Okay, hi everyone again. It's so good to see all of your faces another time. So for our next speaker, we have the president and CEO of Diane von Furstenberg. Prior to joining the company in January of 2020, she served as a chief strategy officer of Jill Stewart in 2019, as well as a managing director of Adiams, a New York-based Japanese luxury brand from 2014 to 2018. And before joining all of these senior management positions, she served as an officer within Polo Ralph Lauren, so specifically, she focused on the global sourcing of the Blue Label, as well as the launch of Polo for Women from 2009 to 2014. She was born in China and educated in the United States, and she is super passionate about leveraging her multicultural and trilingual background to really help companies scale and grow through establishing international offices, as well as global go-to market strategies with a special focus on China. So everyone, please give a really, really warm round of applause for Gabby Harada. Wait, did you memorize that? Yes. You memorized yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Wow, I'm so happy to be here. I'm severely jet lagged. I was away in Asia, Japan, China, two days per each city for like 20 days. So you should take advantage of me being very jet lagged and ask me all the off record questions. I'll probably give very an unfiltered answer because of that. So I actually recently got a promotion as the CEO of DVF, so seeing the president of DVF, that's, I'm just reminded what got me here will not get me there. Every year is a new challenge. But actually three years ago, precisely before, more than three years ago when I joined DVF, I was not the president CEO, I was head of APAC. So I was just like mere director, mid-tier, maybe a little bit higher than mid-tier employee. So I want to tell you what happened um, three years ago that got me at 31 years old, you know, looking the way I look, non-white Chinese person to be the CEO of American Legacy brand. And through this journey, I want to tell you exactly what got me here, um, which is really a modern way to look at design and a modern way to look at creativity. Um, and then I'm gonna just like open up, we can chat, ask me any questions you want. Um, give me your ask, I will share my contact information with you, if I can intro you with anyone in the industry, uh, internship and such, I will help you. That's just my mission. So three years ago, COVID just happened. I'm from China, I've been working in New York for 10 plus years, but still culturally Chinese care about people back home. So when COVID just happened, People were dying in, in Wuhan. I proposed to Diane, our founder, can we have a live streaming? Uh, we want to sell dresses, we want to send all of like the proceeds to the schools in Wuhan to help with the kids and stuff. She said yes, and we did live streaming uh, in a crazy way where I had like 60,000 people watching on Alibaba platform. Uh, 100 dresses are sold out within 10 minutes and went on like the front page of business and fashion and such. And that was a crazy experience because because people were like literally typing, I'm crying, thanks Diane. Diane was like, be, be strong Wuhan, Chinese people always endure hardship. And I, I, was, I became a famous within DVF, which is that we had 200 employees in New York office. And even looking back, I was thinking, wow, to make a name in front of your boss, in front of in the organization you just joined, is so important. And I didn't, I, I was not expert live streaming. All I did is I took a phone, and then I became expert of live streaming because I was just like, talking to the camera, and I was like trying things out. Um, and that's how I made my name with Diane herself. And then March 2020, COVID happened in the US, everything shut down, furloughed and such. Diane called me because she remembered me, right, from the live streaming project. She said to me, Gabby, I think this is it for my brand. We are thinking about closing. Why? Because, and this is pertaining design for a brand as famous as DVF, and I'm assuming not all of you guys know what DVF is. Uh, Diane started DVF, the fashion brand, in 1972. We had the most glorious victory. Every single woman who was going to work for the first time in the 70s and 80s has bought a wrap dress. So that was the cornerstone of our success. But as with all the fashion brands, there's up and downs. When we were having this great success selling wrap dresses, such as the one I'm wearing right now. 
we're also not selling enough because customer, when she has so many wrap dresses, her need is changing, right? She's not going to work in the heels and wrap dress. She's going to work in the sneakers and sweatpants. So what do you do with all of that change? Um, before, 50 years ago, sometimes Diane and I were like debating about products. She would be like, Gabby, I started, who, who else created wrap dress? Who else created one product that sold hundreds of millions? Like, that's what I did in the 70s. I was like, wow, there was no internet 50 years ago, and now there's internet, and now there's uh, 10,000 more fashion brands than before. So why, uh, why is your customer buying your product at 6,000 or some 600 or sometimes thousand dollars when she can buy a simple wrap dress of $50, you know, all of that. So that's kind of what's the, the challenge that we faced, that the brand faced throughout the 2000, 2010. And this is where the hardcore about design is that it, you have to make functional, profitable business through the design. And DVF was, like many other fashion brands, struggling with this bottom line for quite a while, which led to Diane debating about maybe closing this amazing, beloved brand. That's when I raised my hand crazy, proposed a business plan to her and to the TV board. I thought it was so cool, the coolest thing ever to be in front of the board. It's like so intimidating, but such a challenge. I said to the board, I have a way to guarantee you profitability and build the long-term brand equity for DVF. And they're like, wait, how? So basically, long, long story short, my proposal is based on, again, who I am, I'm nothing but Chinese, I'm proposing to leverage our, not only our China market, but also our Beijing China workforce. So this way we do everything more efficiently, more cost effectively, and most important thing, um, improving the product. As um, Stella mentioned, I started in production at Ralph Lauren. It's the most humble department, not design, right? We're the team always standing behind this design team here, and Ms. Lauren would be right there. Design team is here, merchandising team here, marketing team here, and uh, we're like all the way behind, hidden back, because we, we don't talk, we're a production, we're a supportive department. However, one thing I do is that I think about the product, the fabric, the fit, all the time. So, and I'm practical, right? I'm not designer, I'm production. I look at the profit, I look at bottom line all the time. As I said, the classic wrap dress, black and white chain link on the left, how do we go from there? Keep all the brand DNAs, such as the wrap design, the twist, the print, the versatility, you can wear to go to work, you can wear this with the heels, with the sneakers, go to a wedding, all of those elements. And I propose this plan to go from one single product to a variation of this single product. The plan to go from 600 styles a collection to 210 styles a collection. This way we guarantee a higher sell through. We guarantee a low discount rate and that all of that result in customer buying the dress at full price very fast and then we became profitable. So this is the year three of DVA being profitable for the first time in a long time. We are now in the exciting stage to go from like, oh my God, can we survive? To like, okay, what is the next? And whenever we think, of, we answer the question, what's the next? How do we design a new wrap dress? How do we do um, new styles, new marketing? We always ask, what do our customers think? So I genuinely believe the true, we live in the best world right now. You, you, you're not going, you don't have to come from like a wealthy family or with famous last name to be the designer or the creative director. We live in a time where if you can deliver, like I did, right? If you can deliver good design and good design defined by people paying for your design. I always say every single customer who gave me $300 or $1,000, I would be on my knee trying to understand why she gave us the money. Like even for this, like the, the Abigail, which is the long wrap dress, that she is a, so I would call it the dress she, she's $700. I always feel this unease. Wait, who, I am, who are we to put out $700 or $800 dress and expect our customer to buy it? And we all talk about wanting younger customer. Like there's no 25 years old, in my opinion, who would pay $700 unless, okay, you're from a very well family, right? But I don't want to serve her 
yes, she's a customer, but DBF's core is that we make uniform for women in charge. We make uniform for professional women for the first time in the history of the United States. I wanted to make down to earth good product at good price point. So how do I find good fabric? So this black dress and this, especially this um, blue, uh, blue long dress is our best seller. Oh, what's the DNA? Well, Jersey, I take, I use all my sourcing knowledge. I found this Jersey, it's amazing. That's not super expensive. That feels super comfortable, super stretchy. I take all of the design DNAs, the twist. Again, a DBA woman is a woman who looks comfortable and who is look, who's very flattering, who looks confident. So all of that points are featured in this blue dress at $328. Okay, from $700 to $328 while keeping our amazing dress. So right now, all of those products are sold within the first month, selling out, hitting the sell through, which is our KPIs for design within fashion industries. So how many dresses you produce, uh, you take how many dresses are being sold, divided by how many dresses you, are, you produce. Right now, our sell through rate is 82% versus before like much lower rate. So now I'm often selling out than having to discount the product. And that's our way even to answer the sustainability uh, responsibility. Again, when you think about customers, because I know you guys are not just all product design or fashion design, uh, there's a creative, there's designing for the visuals, the campaign. So when, even when we do campaigns, we, before we'd be like, okay, we are the tastemaker. We are the best in deciding what looks chic, what looks good. But now we use customer data to inform us. So all of these images, you know what we do? We look at the open rate, we look at the engagement rate, we look at the impression. So that's our social. So our audience and our email, which is our, so it's upper funnel, right? The audience and then your email uh, mailers and then your customers. We look at, are we serving up creative assets? for our audience and for our customers in a way that's engaging for her. And if we keep making this maybe like a very wealthy looking, very fabulous socialite girl, um, and our audience kept not clicking on it, and she really tells us from her behavior, then we know, okay, you know what? A DVF customers are not that interested in, I say princess, because Diane was a princess, right? That's part of our DNA. She's more interested in, in the assets where this girl at home, hanging out with her friends, or a girl going to work or in the office, or a girl looks very competent in the camera, even though she doesn't look the traditional beauty. Um, so that is how we, how we make those creative decisions from our design perspective on the campaign. So here is like some of the um, examples. We learned that um, on social media, people like something very casual, like a bunch of girls hanging out together and BTVF is always about community. So we make those assets that's not like very glossy magazine-like, that's performed a lot better. We also um, started to, instead of doing like fabulous fashion party, we have things that are like this, which is including like today I'm here. We call it in charge activations, where we effectively insert DVF into a woman's, um, into the culture, a woman's day of life, where we talk to different industry, we get a bunch of women together, we talk to students, um, we uh, give back to the industry, and this has become a more effective way of us doing marketing, which is not about who I am or who we are as a brand, but as a shared identity. Uh, and that includes every team member making the time to talk to um, outside the industry and outside this, and with the students. And we, we have now turned this into called In Charge Activation, where as Diane, our founder, taught us, DBF, before we're a fashion brand, we are um, a mission. Our mission is to connect people, to expand the knowledge base, and to inspire and to eventually give back, to advocate for change. And now for me, I was an international student. Uh, in the U.S., I was told H&B is never a um, possibility for, for a fashion industry. Um, walking through this journey, I now, at DVF, we sponsor H&B. Well, you have to get the lottery. That's another story. Um, we sponsor H&B. We um, try to make decisions based on who you are, based on merit, not based on what you look like or based on 
the socioeconomical family that you are from. Uh, we opened our door at DBF, which is based in Meatpacking District. So if you guys ever stop by, once a month we open our door to students, especially students from a socioeconomically disadvantaged uh, background or um, historically black college. Um, we always make ourselves available to chat with the students and to even give our emails, such what, which is what I'll be doing today. That, and none of that seemed to be related to make a fashion brand. But just as I said, there's a modern way to do design. There's a modern way to make a creative decision, to make a website, to make social media, to make a campaign, to do marketing. I believe that is the only way for any good brand, any good company, any good designer to be successful. And that's just a conviction that I have. It may not be the truth, but I chose to believe that. Uh, and with that, ask me any questions. Don't be shy. Whoever asks the first question, I'll give you a prize, which is a in-charge necklace. I'll give it to you later. <laughs> um, that's, um, that's a little necklace we make um, at DVF that we give to our in-charge audience and uh, our VIP customers. And she would wear this when she goes on like interview or a very important day. It reminds her to be confident. Okay, thank you. It was the worst thing in the world because I didn't know anyone. I had zero connection when I first came here. And my school, which is a liberal arts college, similar to Princeton, there's no fashion department, there's no design department. I, since I made that decision, uh, so when I came here that year, um, was the year Devil Wears Prada came out. That's how I decided that one day I want to be executive, very powerful in New York City like this building, like fashion world. Uh, and since I made that decision, and of course it's not all because of the movie. I always like fashion, I like design, I like color, I like drawing. I also know I'm not that talented to be an artist. Um, I, I like um, business in general, only because I felt like, okay, make something, sell something, and make it big S seems understandable. So that's like loosely how I sort of set my mind on this track. Uh, so the biggest challenge is have no connection. And LinkedIn was not that popular at that time. So what I, to get myself into the door, I literally just print out my resume, which looks really bad because I didn't have experience. I just went to the fashion district in New York City per Google map. No one told me that. I just like per Google map is a fashion avenue. It's like here, 37th street, 42nd street. Um, I just went street by street building by building, floor by floor, door, by, literally, I would go in the building and just go each floor and every door I can knock on, just knock on it. Sometimes I open the door, it's like factory, sometimes it's a fashion house. That's how I got my first internship. And once I get myself one foot in the door, a little bit easier, but still very difficult. So I've sent out probably over thousands of emails begging for opportunity. I will start with who I am, I'm from China. It's like long, now if I can tell myself some tips, I would say write shorter um, code emails, use a little bit more dramatic, more like a value emphasizing uh, sentences and try to focus on what value you can give to the person you're writing to instead of writing an essay about who I am. No one's interested in who I am. Uh, but anyhow, I'll get one response per every thousand emails I send. Sometimes I came across an email from 15 years ago in my email box and immediately close it. It's like very traumatizing <laughs> for me to look at. So now I always have a habit, even though I'm a little bit behind, I'll respond to every single DM on LinkedIn or Instagram. Like I get probably hundreds of uh, requests for connection LinkedIn. I ignore probably them at, at this point, but if you're a student, I just automatically click yes. And it's like, okay, maybe eventually I'll get to that DM. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, like, um, it's almost like a therapy to, to do those work now because 15 years ago was that tough. But I, the trick is that you just tell yourself you have no option. At that time, I told myself it, it's no option to go back to China. It's no option to not have a job. So I'll, do, I'll go to the end of the world. I'll outwork anyone. So when I get that one 
critical internship at Ralph Lauren. So that was how I got eventually my H1B in. I literally was the first one to arrive, last one to leave. I was often leaving. I always remember, because it was in New York City, right? It's like around this time, it's, this internship starts like pre-summertime. I always remember this New York City, that summer air around 11 midnight. It's a bit cool, but it's still hot because when I left work every single day, that was the internship where it led me to be sent to Ralph Lauren Hong Kong headquarters as the only student slash employee. And that was, I was the only one who the VPs wrote me, wrote letter to HR asking to extend my time. Because literally, if I just left this, like, this huge project I was working on, no one was gonna be able to finish it. So my professor had to let me come to come, come back to FNM later. So I had all of these ex ex exemptions that resulted in me getting that HMB and a job opportunity after I graduated. Yeah, in the beginning, that's all you got, right? Like, because I have no connection. And I did something crazy when I was Ralph Lauren. <laughs> crazy is the key word of my experience. Uh, Mr. Lauren came to the elevator. Oh, so, sorry. Miss Lauren was in the elevator. I rushed into the elevator. Uh, it's, again, like, most people would just never go in, right? Because, like, it's, like, so embarrassing. Like, you're, in, that's a big boss. You shouldn't, like, not disturb him. And it's like a second before the elevator door closed. I think because I was just de desperate, right? Like any opportunity. If I can send a thousand emails, of course I'm going to run to the elevator with Mr. Lauren. So I did. And immediately said, I'm your only employee from China, which is probably not true. But I think mainland Chinese, I was probably the very few one. I said, Mr. Lauren, if you give me the opportunity, I will make... Ralph Lauren, the most successful brand in China, in my, in my home country. And he said, oh, that's so cool. He's always very nice. He said, oh, you should check out our Hong Kong office. Oh, we just bought back our licensing. So now we're uh, operating directly in uh, Hong Kong, in China. And then I marched right into the HR office after the elevator. And I said to the HR um, friend, so important to make friends, that Mr. Lauren said I should go to Hong Kong office representing New York. And HR said, he said that? I was like, yeah, he's dead. he did. Well, you can check the camera. He just said to me in the elevator. <laughs> uh, and then my HR friend did the whole process. Um, so I was, so that's how I leveraged my Chinese speaking back then. It's very juvenile way, right? 10 years later, I learned enough, like all the experience, all the hard work has taught me enough of business fundamentals for me to, three years ago to propose this plan. So this plan is very complex. It's uh, utilizing, so certain department we do in China, certain department we do in, in the US, um, and China market, very crucial market for us. How do we uh, maintain the success in China market while be very internationally, globally successful? Because certain style may not work for uh, global versus China, all of those knowledge. But I realized I was the only one who can do it because I was the only employee. I was the only director at DVF three years ago who is Chinese. So I always thought about this as a strength. But even, even so, when Diane called me three years ago, she said, I chose you to run my company. I literally said, wait, are you sure? And she said, what are you talking about? Give you the biggest promotion in your life. And I said, well, because I'm not white. She said, what are you talking about? Well, I said, I'm not white. I'm 31 years old and I'm not a man. Like all the CEOs in my industry look like that. And she said, because you're none of that, because you're Chinese, I want you to run my company. So that's when she like hit in my head forever. And she said, own, own your insecurity becomes your asset. But you really have to pivot your brain. You have to go very deep who you are, you know, beyond your Chinese, your, your other things. For me, I love art, fashion, whatever. And I'm a woman, I'm a, I was a girl, if I go all the way back, I was like, because my friends said, who, what 18 years old says she wanted to be a CEO? That's like, not like crazy. And I was like, well, yeah, why, why did I want that? when I was so young, and I realized, oh my God, because I'm, I I'm a girl. I was born as a girl in mainland China, in north of China, where girls are considered bad news versus the sun when you were born. I was told that very early on, and I was angry about it. I wanted to somehow one day be the most successful daughter and somehow change the world. In China, where, where I grew up, to affect change, 
definitely not through politics, but maybe through business, there is a slight opportunity you can affect change. And ah, okay, I want to have a business. Okay, I want to be the boss. Okay, CEO of the business. So that's where that came from. Whatever that is, if you go really deep about who you are, that's, you can pivot all of, any of that into a strength that you have when you have nothing else. <laughs> different business approaches. Oh, thank you. Do you find that you have to take different business approaches in different parts of the world? And if so, what are those? Oh my gosh. What a timely, timed question, because I just came back from China, right? So my China part was a business trip. Um, and if I'm talking, if I talk like what I'm talking to you right now, to our Chinese employee or a China team, I think they would think I'm like lost my mind or something. Because you don't talk in this like animated way. You're, you're supposed to be quiet, modest, and considerate and be a good listener within the Chinese working environment. So I kept thinking, wow, even though I am a Chinese, I've lived in the US for so long, I almost forgot how to carry and behave myself. But immediately I pivoted, and in the end, I think I was more like blended in with our China workforce. So I think, yes, you absolutely will, I think, to be very effective in different culture. In Asian culture, East Asian culture, uh, leaders consider someone walking behind a group, like a caretaking way, versus I think in corporate America, a leader is supposed to be more assertive, uh, more like leading in front of a group. So I definitely think of that, especially now we have two workforces, one in the US, actually one in London, and one in China. So I, in the morning, I will be carrying myself this way. In the evening, when I'm working with the China team, I entirely change this. And I'm thinking, oh wow, this must be a, like a very unique um, ability that I'm gonna keep uh, practicing. I don't complain about it. I don't complain about doing two shift when during work, work day, when my, sh my second shift started at nine or 10 p.m. Because I'm thoughtful, right? I'm a thoughtful in the Asian culture leader way. I wanted to work with our team when it's their morning time and they would do the same for me. They would all stay late, uh, 10 or 11 p.m. when it's my morning time. And then we love each other, we trust each other and then we're able to make the way the best brand in the world. Yeah, uh, my question is, you mentioned working with the design team, not being the designer yourself. What's the kind of process um, that you're comfortable about, especially when it comes to like getting to people, yeah. from what you say, taking out an interview with them, and then from there, if you're not the person doing the interview, they'll give you evaluation and talk about it. Yeah, I'm pr I think I'm mostly proud of how I work with our design team, but <laughs> If our design team is here, they may not think that because they would say, uh, oh, Gabby, you talk about customer or being commercial too much. Um, and my best way is that I create a framework for our design team because I have learned and I have made mistakes. I, have, I was very extreme in this data-oriented way of thinking. Literally, I would do a box and this is the style you do, blah, blah, blah. And that didn't work because I realized the best design that you have to combine math and magic together. So I've learned that I must respect and empower creativity. So instead of telling them exactly what to do, I just create a framework, like supportive system. So literally right now, I, I'll give you a trade secret. So at the beginning of the season, what we do is that we look at, so right now is, uh, let's just say, uh, spring season. We're designing spring 2024. So we start by, uh, digesting all of the selling data and customer feedback for the, this season and the last season, so the holiday last year. With all of that, I was like, okay, out of 200 styles, we have uh, 50,000 customers buying what we call like a wrap dress, so carry over styles. And we have another 38,000 customers buying test and learn, like a new style, like some of my style. Like we never had that before, but we made this and it's successful. So I'll give design team, okay, this, how many is this, how many is this? And I'll tell her, okay, our customers um, like black and white print. Um, and she buys black and white print every season, particularly she buys that in spring season because people feel like wearing some print because it's like sun's like warm and such, but she will never go after like crazy print. So can you always give me like 10 styles of black and white print? However, she likes some color, give me some kind of decorative color of black and white print. I'll literally go like 
down to that detail. And I would say all customers, nowadays there's a trend after pandemic, people like to wear tops or pants, like separate, we call it not dress. Um, I guess because it's versatile, like we can make a top and she can wear leggings, shorts, jeans, whatever. So I was like, okay, can we dial it down? Instead of a, a 121 dresses, let's do a 100 dresses, let's do 20 more tops. So literally, this is how we go one by one. So we have a, about eight dimensions. When I, like, uh, when I, what, what I said category, that's one dimension, and within dimension, different attributes. We have eight dimensions full of attributes, but I'll never give our design team that. That's in my head. It's my job to sit next to them when they have 100, 200, 300 beautiful sketches. It's my job to sit next to them, help them be like, kind of put them into their different grids. It's my job to say, okay, we are not gonna make, and that's what, what, what many fashion houses did before or do before. Suddenly, before you realize it, you have thousands of styles of collection. And it's my conviction that our customers don't want that many styles, and our product would just end in the discounted shops. So let's make less. So that's also my job to kind of do that. But in a way, I've learned to tell our design team, not in a way, because I really came to think designers, you really almost like you grab your heart, you, you pour your heart out to put on the table. So when you say, okay, this house is to be dropped, it's like very hurtful. Uh, thing to say. So how do we say, you know, maybe we save this out for next season and such. So I learned all of that uh, in the past three years, working not just with design team, because that's what I did Ralph Lauren before, but in my first time to be the boss of a design team. So I've learned to do all of that. And don't forget, I have my boss, which is Diane herself. She's a designer as well. She designed a lot of DVF dresses. So can you imagine when I tell her, Diane, this dress, when we cannot do it. It didn't sell before, so we're not gonna do it for next spring. She may be really upset, right? Or she may be um, like, no, I say, I, you have to put this dress in. So I also work with her in that capacity. And it's like very educational experience. Yeah, go ahead. I think that's where, because DVF is such a small brand, people think DVF is big, but we're a niche brand, especially now we're financially independent and we are profitable. We have 138,000 customers. Um, that's not that many, if you're thinking that's like many compared to Coach or like Michael Kors, that type of thing. So it, the reason I say we don't have that many customers is that we have a very, a sticky, small community, and if you love DVF, you really love DVF. What we have seen is the best sellers in China versus in the US versus in UK are pretty much the same. Um, so for a woman who buys DVF, she wants to look feminine. So that's all, always number one criteria. She wants to look like she's okay with people looking at her because it's print. And she likes jersey fabric. So we realize if we do our job well, which is producing high quality, affordable, uh, feminine dresses or separate, the Chinese customers will just buy it, same as New York customer. But however, there are certain caveats that true, like Chinese customers want. For example, it's still relatively formal environment to go to office in China. Um, and uh, they're still kind of like such a fast rising middle class where she wanted to buy that one dress. She can wear it to work. She can wear this to a like girls night out after. And we try to hit all of those value proposition in the one product. And that is how we um, deliver based on for our China market, which is value proposition based, which is very similar to here. But here there's a little bit more emotion. Like we we'll make something like if, you just fall in love with that dress, you buy it. In China, customers are like very calculated. Like they think it through like very intense process. Uh, how do I stay? I, 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 every two weeks, you can find me in our store. 
uh, every Friday afternoon, every two weeks, I will be servicing customers in the store. I did that in China too, which is like so cool. Uh, sometimes they can recognize, sometimes they don't, and be like, "Wait, are you? Do you work? Do, what do you work at DVF? You you know so much, like, because they can tell I'm not like a retail staff, and I'm like, they're like, "What department do you work at?" And I would normally say, "Well, all of the departments," and they're like, "What do you mean all of the departments?" Uh, and then our store manager would be like, oh, she's the CEO of DBF. And the customer said, what? And sometimes she would buy a lot and would like take her to our office just, like for a tour, um, which is a humbling experience. I think maybe I still don't look like, don't look the part, whatever. When someone knows I'm a CEO versus they don't know I'm a CEO, that person changes so much. Like what they say to me, how they look at me, how they shake my hand. So I'm forever humbled, and I think remembering that title is, is a thing. If people treat me so much nicer because I'm a CEO, all I would remember is that I'm going to treat, treat people, everyone, as nicely as possible. It's hard sometimes because I'm like being treated poorly before she knows I'm a CEO, and then she knows and says she treat me nicely, yeah. Um, thanks so much for being here and sharing your story. Um, and kind of jumping off of what you were just saying, I'm curious how you kind of have tried to handle these perceptions around female leadership and like kind of being assertive, but still being warm and friendly and also um, kind of code switching, which I think you mentioned and how you're, I know it's like a very exhausting thing. So how you kind of try to handle that and recover. Um, I, th I think I have several layers, right? There's a gender thing and there's a race thing. And there's, for me, there's also age thing. So I definitely often felt, nowadays a little bit better, but when I first had this job three years ago, it was really tough where I feel like I enter a room, I'm like the young, like always like not experienced enough and doesn't look the part and also being a woman. Um, and then I'm very lucky because in fashion industry, there, there are enough leaders who, who are women, maybe just not a CEO position. Uh, I'm also lucky that I felt very supported by Diane and the board and by our team. And I think by our customers, I think about all of them very deeply. And somehow just like naturally happened, I definitely feel pretty comfortable. Like coming here, I definitely was not nervous at all. Uh, like I was like very excited to talk to you guys. I remember first time I was on the stage talking to a audience, I was so nervous. I was like, my hands were shake, shaking. Uh, and all I know is that three years later, my hands are not shaking anymore. I felt very at ease with you guys. And what changed? I think practice. Like I have had this job for three years. Um, I think as anything you do for the first time, you're gonna be nervous because you just like don't know how to do it. If you keep going at it, eventually you get better. For me, practice the muscle. Like um, in the U.S. work environment, I dial I dial up my maybe corporate America assertiveness. And when I'm working in the evening time or working in China, I dial it down. I dial up more than being humble, modest, and being a listener and just being very thoughtful. The more I do it, the more I don't even think about it when I do it. Um, I think, yeah, practice. But you just have to, in the beginning, push yourself out of comfort zone. I just remember that. I think I was students at some kind of this conference. And when they asked, oh, anyone has a question? You know, your heart is pounding. <laughs> You're like, I kind of want to ask a question. But oh my god, there's so many people here. I don't, what if I don't ask a Polish question or English, not even first language, right? I just remember when I was a kid, I always like try to push myself, like no matter what, Let's make a, I'm gonna make a deal with myself. I will raise my hand and ask a question, even if it's a stupid question or not smart question. So I remember using that push uh, as a practice in the beginning, whatever works for you. So I'm gonna give you, I'm gonna try to give you a really um, in intellectual answer. So 
most people are gonna tell you, oh, there's so many department or function in the fashion industry, depending on which one you go, the answer is different. But if I think deeply, you can roughly um, categorize any jobs within fashion industry into two types. One is the um, creative, which is like design, um, like the making the pictures, the campaign, or like a product development or picking the color or print. They're like creative where it's like you kind of sit there, you, you, you make something pretty. And then all of other jobs categorized into business case. So there's the sales, there's marketing, there is the retail. Basically you're not, create, you're not creating a pretty thing. You are trying to make that thing marketable, go to market, or you are make, trying to make that thing in a cost effective way. So that's business case. So if you're on the business case lane, sorry, I, I guess I picked that because I'm that lane. I think the best hard skill is um, Excel uh, or any Google Sheets, whatever that is, that you're able to sort of sit there. You are being creative by making a PNL. Like I was three years ago when I made the business proposal, I really, I, I had the PNL from DBA, but I remember none of them is good because I'm trying to create a new business model. I remember opening a new Excel, a blank Excel. That's always, uh, to me, that's a blank, blank Excel is as scary as a blank canvas to an artist. You are creating a truly a new business. I remember doing that. I was thinking, oh my God, this is so cool. I'm creating a, I was writing the overhead. I was writing marketing. I was writing my project revenue. All of that number, numbers actually pointed to a lot of decisions, right? How we're gonna rent, how we're gonna reduce, okay, well, I'm gonna make more, I remember, oh, I'm gonna make a revenue in a way that's profitable. What does that mean? Okay, I need to make high premium quality revenue. Oh, what does that mean? That means I cannot make many styles, which are gonna go to, to discount. I'm gonna make less styles. Where I make, I need to make styles that are high sell through. What, what does that mean? Okay, we need to have a framework on value proposition for our design team. Well, literally like this. So all of that come from ability, simple ability to have a Excel PNL. You're deducting and dividing all of those, calculating margin. So reading um, the um, like business of fashion, reading Women's Wear Daily, even though you don't understand what that is, read it. And understanding the Excel, all of that is just like such a good hardcore skill to have. Um, and for on the design creative side, man, that's really tough. Um, I'm trying to think of all the great designers I worked with, and I think this genuine vulnerability and the curiosity for beautiful things. I remember, I always like to hang out with our design team, and I just remember they would look at something like super random, like a corner on the street or a tree, or like sometimes a tree trunk. And they're like, Gabby, yeah, look, this is a, there's a print hidden here. I was like, wait, that's a tree trunk. But uh, she like took a picture and zoomed really in, and it really become our twig print, uh, one of our DBA print that we now do. So I think the truly the eye for pretty things, um, and the training your eyes to understand color, to read color, to read nature, um, going to museum and. Oh, another really hardcore skill, just like sit there every time there's a new season, just Vogue.com is free, right? You can look at hundreds of runway shows a season. All the great designers I work with, what they do, they sit there. When the new season comes, they would go through every one of the big brands and they would screenshot good styles and they would, do a, they would write down what's good about it. When you do that four times or six times a year for 10 years, your brain has this library of good design. And that to me is a hard skill for a designer. And in terms of soft skill, the same for each division, which is um, communication, communication uh, skill to be a good listener, to know how to advocate, uh, advocate your idea without upsetting the person you're talking to, um, and be a good team player and all of that, yeah. Oh, here, sorry. Hi, um, oh, thank you so much for being here. I'm curious, um, with such a big role of kind of transforming DVF and like revitalizing the brand, um, that obviously touches every part of the business. So how have you like found synergies within departments and like aligned everything to like transform? Because um, that's such a big task. So I'm just curious, like 
what you've done um, as a leader. To yeah, totally. I think that's like my main task. Um, I'm still trying to summarize what the CEO job is, I feel. And I think that is like, uh, I literally have the word synchronizing, synchronizing within each different department, or no, across different department. It's like 50% of my, my work almost, because I felt like I am in most of the important meeting, right? There's a marketing meeting, there's design meeting. Sometimes I'm like actually doing a design print, which is a very privileged meeting. And then we go to the e-com, like buyers meeting. And I'll be like, oh, our design team didn't know you need a black and white print. We didn't know the black and white print is number one search result. Um, but of course we have sales report, but sometimes, you know, like everything, things can be lost in just like those type of reports. And then we'll try to take all of these insights from the e-com meeting, then back to the print and design meeting. So I think a key thing I try to do is I try to uh, be as transparent as possible. I try to share the information as much as possible. You can see me often in the one meeting, I'll quickly tap up something. I'll just share those like bullet points and some uh, screenshots or some pictures for the other three departments. And I will synchronize also between the senior management team and um, the junior team because I think, I think it's very important for the junior team to hear um, the big picture, the, the initiatives and the whys. I think I'm the first one. I, I, I take my board meeting deck and I do a company-wide meeting to go slide by slide because I think every employee is important in a way as a board member because they're the one on the front line executing. Um, so 50% of my time is to share information. And I also learned that when you share information, how you say it. You, you, I, I do think about transla translating. So that's why I immediately say the creative work and the business case work, or left brain, right brain. So uh, there's a lot of synchronizing has to happen between these two types of departments, plural uh, departments. So I'll take all of the business and I'll tell you, come, okay, you get, it's too complicated. If you have to say all of this 20 uh, like KPIs into like two sentences, to an artist, what would you say? So I'll like do a lot of those translation. And for the, our creative people to the business, uh, and I would say like our creative people are inspired by this and that. Here's emotional reason, and this is what we believe it's a DNA, brand DNA. How do we get our creative people to understand what the customers want? You have to translate, instead of numbers, say this way. So I do sharing, information sharing, I do information translating. Yeah. Hi, you mentioned having these in-charge activation events for people who shop at DVF or just building that community. I'm kind of curious what goes on at these events and how do they support DVF's mission to kind of further strengthen their community. Yeah. Nowadays, we even build a website, joinincharge.com, which is the little logo here. So I kind of started this a year ago because we have zero marketing dollar and uh, I wanted to, so I'm like, Diane has this thing where every morning she has this magic wand, she says, that she connects to people who never know each other, uh, but who would benefit from knowing each other. So often she give that magic to me. Like I would be like, Bob Iger is my role model. I wanted to build we have like Disney one day and she would be like, Bob, please meet Gabby. <laughs> like it was crazy and, and or Sam Altman is my recent crush. And I was like, oh my gosh, I wanna share this connection with our team. Like maybe I think about um, our, or my colleagues and then I think about my friends or other, um, my fellow fashion or my fellow uh, woman executives like from other community. So the more I think about sharing those connections, the more I say, oh, can we have a get together? So the um, in-charge activation becomes like about 30, 45 minutes fire set chat. I never say panel discussion because we're like very authentic way of talking. Uh, we, we have done 40 in-charge activation last year. So we did one with Google, with the EY, with the Morgan Stanley, with the college. Uh, we did one with uh, Vanderbilt in Nashville uh, two weeks, ago, uh, uh, two months ago. So basically sharing the knowledge, sharing the connection and very, tips driven, like what are we trying to solve? Like we did one with the lawyers <laughs> last year where it was like, wait, we're, that's not cool that 50% of JD students are women, but I think it's 12% of partners are 
women, like how do we change it? And all lawyers said, well, because there's no role model, I want to network with other female partners, but there's not that many. I said, okay, I know all the big deal female partners, just through, again, being in this privileged position to be a CEO. So we get, like, I got the Gucci, I got some other big partners, female partners together, and 50 uh, JD students, as well as the young junior lawyers, associates, and that becomes in charge activation. Uh, in the beginning, we did this just because it's, uh, again, very healing, <laughs> personally speaking. But then what happens is that 50% of the people, so normally 50 people to 100 people, man, some of them don't even know DBF. And when I got to share my story, my story is very much about the product. Then when I talk about product, it very much make people intrigued that they want to try on. And then be, end up becoming a, um, like a sales KPI as well. Like out of 50 people, 10 women would uh, buy the app in the end and then become our customer. So in charge activation, we have, oh, we, we have, we have no bu budget. We, have no, we don't hire anyone, just us. Everyone volunteer. But now it becomes a thing that we have a little bit of money. So we're trying to uh, roll it out a little bit more. Thank you. Oh, I think that's, yeah, so find me, oh, sorry, one last question. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for being so transparent about your experiences. Um, my question is, so like, based on what's, like, going on in, like, the fashion industry with, like, fast fashion and it being so profit-driven, I'm curious to know what sort of is, like, DBF's um, approach to, like, sustainability. Um produce less would be the number one thing that we're doing. Um, the number two thing we're doing is that we are now using two sus environmentally sustainable fabric called EcoViro. Um, and we're, because most of our fabric is printed, which takes a lot of water. So we partner up with our factory to have a filtration system so that 85% of the water can be reused. But all of that, I feel like it's not as significant as some like a, bigger fashion group, like obviously when they have a lot of money, they can invest in a lot of those um, practices. So where I end up talking a lot, which I did a little bit today, is having this metrics, having this data-oriented approach to make less product and to, to make product more accurately. Um, I think that's where if I can do one thing on this topic, I want to do more about how to make less and make things more accurately. Therefore, to, re to resolve one single biggest damage that our industry does for the planet, which is uh, inventory, or like just like going to the trash and stuff. Thanks so much. So you can find me on, I, w I was going to say LinkedIn, but I'm so behind. I give up on killing that right dots. But you can uh, find me on Instagram, in, uh, Instagram DM. I do handle 100%. Uh, I do, I also post a lot of like behind the scene, literally like in DVF headquarters. So you can find me on Instagram, just my name, Gabby Hirata. I think it's very obvious. I think my description, number one fan of DBF or something. Uh, but yeah, DM me if you have an internship or a request, or if you are trying to get into the creative design industry. Um, if I can help you, I will try my best to help you. Thanks. Thanks for listening.